not only did he fast for five days, but he ran five complete marathons. But not only that, he was a type one diabetic. I brought him on today to talk to him on how the hell he did it and how he survived. I would argue it's more difficult to get into ketosis as a type one because we have to inject insulin. A fat burning body has to have low insulin levels in order to release the fat. Do they ever advise to go five days without any food? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know the answer to that. So I have a fascinating interview today. I mean, this is going to be a bizarre interview because here's a person, a doctor, Dr. Ian Lake, who did some wild, wild, crazy things that he probably shouldn't even have survived this. But what he did, not only did he fast for five days, but he ran five almost complete marathons, 100 miles in five days. But not only that, he was a type one diabetic. So... I brought him on today to talk to him on how the hell he did it and how he survived. Welcome, Ian. Thanks for coming on. Hello. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. So first of all, you're a medical doctor. You're a type 1 diabetic. If we take a look at like the, the main consensus of the medical community with type 1, um, do they ever advise to go five days without any food? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know the answer to that. Um, it's very difficult to persuade um, anyone to um, ask us to fast and skip one meal. So um, I was trying to work out a, a workaround for uh, how we can convince people that one meal skipping would be safe. So this was an extreme version of uh, skipping a meal, really. You, you know, to, to prove this point, um, you, you went to the extreme and you did this with how many people? Uh, eight people. Eight people did this. So you you basically uh, did a combination of a few things that were very difficult to do on their own. Let's first talk about how many calories you actually burned within five days. Was it roughly about, what, 20,000 calories? Yeah, it was roughly 20,000 calories. So we worked out how many calories we'd need to, if you believe in the glycogen storage depletion idea, to exhaust our glycogen storage tenfold to make absolutely sure we were in ketosis. So we worked out about 20,000 calories would be required. I think we used a little bit more than that from memory, but we didn't actually physically record it. Um, the, the other thing we wanted to do really was to um, show how safe um, nutritional ketosis really is. So we wanted to put ourselves into very deep ketosis. So that was the rationale for doing this, really. Okay. So so just to back up on, uh, just for those people that don't know what the word um glycogen is you depleted your glycogen that's just the stored sugar in your liver right so when you when you exercise you're going to use that as fuel and then after that's gone you're going to tap into your fat reserves right exactly yeah yeah so um typically first let's start with a diabetic what is the difference between a type 1 and a type 2 someone with type 1 diabetes cannot produce their own insulin in enough volume to maintain blood sugar because one of the key features of insulin, functions of insulin, is to reduce blood sugar and keep blood sugar at, a, at an even rate. Um, and someone with type 2 diabetes has more than enough insulin. In fact, most people with type 2 diabetes have too much insulin. And theirs is due to an overfueling issue such that their body cannot handle the amount of fuel that they're putting into their bodies, mostly carbohydrates. So there's a big difference between the two conditions. Type 1s, we need to inject insulin because we don't produce any. And in type 2s, they need to adopt a lifestyle strategy that naturally reduces the amount of insulin they're producing. So they're not at all com comparable conditions. So if insulin lowers blood glucose and a type 2 has high insulin, shouldn't they have low blood glucose? They become insulin resistant. This is the problem. Uh, people with type 2 diabetes, um, the various ideas on it, but their fat cells sort of stop the body sort of taking on more fat and they become resistant to the amount of insulin they've got. Because as well as lowering blood sugar, insulin is a hormone that stimulates um, fat deposition. So it's a fat storage hormone as well as a, a glucose lowering hormone. And the two things work together. So in order to lower blood sugar, you either exercise or you you put it into your into your liver initially and then into your adipose tissue, your fat tissues as fat. So we think of insulin as a glucose lowering hormone and a fat storage hormone primarily. Okay, so when someone um, is a type one, they don't have the insulin to regulate blood glucose. So 
what's going to happen when they start exercising and not eating? They don't have fuel. They're obviously, they, they have to tap into their fat reserves, right? Um, and um, talk a little bit about that as well as a really key issue, which is, is um, adapting to running on fat or ketones. Explain that process. Our body can multi-fuel. So we can use sugars and we can use um, fats for our fuel. And of course, fats will break down into ketone bodies and we can use ketone bodies as fuel as well. So in the ideal situation, our bodies can flick between whatever fuel they need for the requirements at the time. So whether you have type 1 diabetes or not, if you're performing exercise as like a sprint without any oxygen, you will have to use glucose for, for your for your energy source. But if you're doing a more aerobic or more relaxed um, uh, amount of physical activity, you're burning oxygen and you can choose really whether you're using uh, glucose or fat as your fuel. However, um, you're limited a little bit as to how you can select your fuel because if you have too much insulin on board, you're blocking fat burning. So fat burning is impossible if you've got too much insulin on board. Now, people do burn fat when they are exercising and there's this fat burning zone, which is otherwise known as zone two, because there's a hormone that called hormone sensitive lipase, which is which, which um, enables fat to be burned. And that is also stimulated by um, uh, lowering insulin or adrenaline, cortisol, growth hormone, things like that. So stress hormones will release that. But if you have too much insulin, it will override those hormones and, and block fat burning. So then you become entirely dependent on, on glucose. So most people with type 1 diabetes will be dependent on glucose because they're not encouraged to burn fat. So we tend to have too much insulin on board. So our bodies are multi-fuel. We can flick between fuels as we need them. And if we're, if we're fat adapted, all that means is that your, your fueling choice for, your, for your, just your food will be low carbohydrate. So low carbohydrates um, require less insulin in, to, to either be injected or for your own body to produce insulin. Because, because as type ones, we're exactly the same as people with, with no diabetes and our insulin requirements, except we just know how much insulin a non-diabetic body would need for the same for the same requirements. So a fat burning body um, has to have low insulin levels in order to release the fat. Do you, am I, are you still with me? At that yeah, point? yeah. So basically, um, in order to get into the fat burning, we must lower insulin. That's really the key factor, right? Exactly. So then, then we can free up the fat burning and, and when we're adapted and it takes about two to three weeks to fully adapt. Some people would say it takes even longer and then the, the, your body will naturally burn fat quite happily, produce ketone bodies and have a very low requirement for sugar. The important thing about glucose or sugar is that we don't need to eat sugar in order to produce it. Our body will produce more than enough for our requirements. And an obvious example of that is those poor people that get pulled out of disaster zones like earthquake zones and they haven't eaten for six or seven days, but they haven't expired because they are producing enough energy for their body requirements, some of which will be sugar. So we, we, we respect the fact that our body's multi-fuel and we wanted to show in this um, 100 mile run that we can safely use um, uh, ketone bodies and fat as fuel and have no requirement for insulin. Uh, sorry, no requirement for sugar at all. Incredible. Okay, so if, um, there are a lot of people that are trying to um, lose more weight, they're plateaued. You know, I've been telling people the most you can lose per week is two pounds of fat. Uh, and that's if you're healthy. <laughs> but this experiment that you did, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, on average, um, all of you lost about what, almost almost seven pounds of fat yeah. in, in five days, right? Yes. Okay. So um, to get into this uh, keto adaptation, obviously you're going to have to either lower your carbs. And of course, fasting is lowering your carbs. <laughs> yes. And, um, and then on top of everything else, you're exercising. So if someone were even to think about doing a fast, do you have to um, work up to it? I mean, you're not going to just start running and not eating right away. I mean, 
you're going to have to, you said it takes um, weeks to get into the keto uh, adaptation or, or fat adaptation. Um, tell us a little bit about how someone can work on getting themselves into the keto adaptation state. Is it just a matter of low carbs or do you have to maybe combine fasting at the same time? Both are very useful to do. Um, the, the, the only way you're going to produce ketones and be in ketosis is to burn fat. Uh, and, and ketones are a natural product of fat burning. So in order to fat burn, you have to lower your insulin. In order to lower your insulin, you have to reduce the, the main fuel that stimulates insulin, namely carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are the prime driver in our diet for insulin production. So cutting down your carbohydrates is, is very important and severely restricting your carbohydrates to what we call the ketogenic zone. So your body has then to burn fat. You have to force your body into fat burning. That's around about 30 to 50 grams of carbs a day, which is about a tenth of what most people would naturally eat. Right. Um, it, it's not difficult to do, but you have to sort of, you have to concentrate on it, especially if you're, um, you, you like sugar or you're a little bit addicted to sugar. It takes a little bit more willpower. Um, don't forget when your insulin levels drop, um, naturally as a result of not eating carbohydrates, you will actually um, urinate a little bit more because your, your insulin will enable your body to excrete salt or sodium and with the salt goes the water. So it's important to replace the fluids and just to drink more. Some people say constipation is an issue. Fluids are very, very good for that. And it doesn't last. It only lasts a few days, if, if at all. And the other thing is you may need to think about replacing some of your salts, magnesium, uh, sodium, you know, table salt or whatever, because of this salt excretion caused by the, the lower levels of insulin. And after that, it's pretty straightforward. You go into ketosis within within days. Um, type 1s, we can go into ketosis after the first meal because we have to inject our insulin so we don't have to wait for it to reduce in some ways. Um, and fasting is, is useful because it makes you much more insulin sensitive. So if you're fasting, you become more sensitive to the insulin you've got. So you'll naturally be, be more able to get into ketosis. And that's it, really. Um, one of the big breakthroughs I had, so when I learned about the ketogenic diet, just completely by accident, thank goodness for the internet, uh, you know, I'm a medical professional, I've never heard of it in, in the training materials that we're given. Um, I started doing a half marathon a month. I thought that was good for me because I'm not really an athlete in many ways. I'm just an enthusiastic jogger. And I thought, well, if I do a half marathon a month as a keto, that'd be a great experiment. So the first two, I actually fueled up with, with, with protein, bacon, eggs or whatever. And I thought, well, you've got to have some energy before you start running. You know, that's what we're always told. You've got to carb up, you know, you've got to have your pasta and your bananas or whatever if you're carbing up. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll have that. And then I got involved in the bulletproof coffees, which were a bit of a fad at the time in the sense of butter and coconut oil in your coffee. And then on the third one, finally, finally, you know, stupid me, I thought, well, why am I actually giving myself energy before I'm running, filling my stomach up and they're diverting blood flow away from my muscles, if you like, when I'd worked out that with my body fat mass, I had 85,000 calories of fat and I have a body mass index of 23. Uh, Plus I have um, so 85,000 calories, I have 17% fat mass. So it worked out about 85,000, I think. So that's our average sort of fat mass. And um, so I thought, well, why can't I just burn the fat that I've got? Or I take it in, if you see what I mean. So it took a while to get out of the habit of doing physical activity for, for uh, doing, sorry, sorry, fueling up for physical activity. I thought, well, I've, I've got the fuel. All, I, all I'm doing is just burning it at probably you know, my slow jogging speed, twice the rate that I'm burning it when I'm walking. So it wasn't a big deal to think, well, you can fast actually when you're doing physical activity. And of course, that that, that was wonderful from the point of view of di type 1 diabetes, because there's none of this complicating worry about injecting insulin when you're having carbs. So that really freed things up. So on top of that, I thought, well, let's just extend the half marathon and try to just sort of nudge the envelope to, to put beyond doubt this concern that type 1s need insulin, uh, uh, need carbs, carbohydrates if they're taking insulin, and put beyond doubt the fact that if you're in nutritional ketosis, it's not a risk for what's called diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a very severe complication of type 1 diabetes. And the two aren't the same thing, but they're often confused by, by clinicians as, as, as 
nutritional ketosis will lead to diabetic ketoacidosis. Oh, okay. So let's talk about this because this is a complex topic. We'll simplify it. Tell us in simple terms to a fifth grader, what is ketoacidosis? Okay. So if your body is not producing insulin at all, um, you cannot then um, put glucose anywhere. So any food that you eat or any sugar that your body is producing naturally um, cannot be put into cells uh, actively. So you can't get rid of sugar in the blood. So if the sugar can't be removed from the blood into the cells, the cells are relatively starved of energy. So then because insulin is not existent, so this is a type one problem, it's, a, it's purely a type one problem. If insulin is not existent, then you, you cannot store fat, you have to burn fat. So not only do you get build up of blood glucose, but you get a runaway fat burning. Now ketones normally feed back on all of this process and stop they keep they stop themselves rising all the time. But if you've got no, and they make the body produce more insulin, but if you've got no insulin, you can't stop that process. So you get a combination of a high blood sugar, high ketones, which the body tries to vent by getting you to breathe them out or pee them out. And, and also you pass a lot of urine because your, your sugars in, in your kidneys is so concentrated, it drags the fluid out with it. And that makes you thirsty. So um, that becomes a medical emergency. Um, even people like myself who are, who are in nutritional ketosis are at risk because sometimes if you get a septicemia or a very severe infection, it means you need a huge amount more insulin. And a lot of us are a little bit re resistant to taking that. So for example, when I had COVID, which was only like a cold for me, luckily, uh, my insulin requirements went up from 20 units a day to 60 units a day. Mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. So, so a person with no diabetes would have the same insulin requirement, and but they would not go into ketoacidosis because they've got natural insulin on board to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. We have to inject it. So it's totally different to nutritional ketosis, which is just a, a lowering of the of the insulin that you inject or your natural insulin, and and it's just a regulated process. If you've got insulin in your body sufficient, you will not go into diabetic ketoacidosis. So the risk of getting ketoacidosis really is if you're a diabetic and you do forget to take your insulin. Yes. An average person, a healthy person starts a ketogenic diet and someone mentions, well, usually you're going to see this in the news. Oh yeah, the, you're going to, you might develop ketoacidosis. That's pretty much a myth. Yes. hundred percent. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't, um, it doesn't work with the science. Got it. Yeah, I know. I, I've seen that so many times. Um, now, as far as um, this adaptation into just keto adapted or fat adapted, you work with patients, I'm guessing you probably help them with their getting on a ketogenic diet, I'm guessing. Um, do you find that some people have a harder time fasting for a longer period of time than others, or is that dependent on insulin resistance and it's just a matter of time and, and, and doing it over a period of time where they can go longer and longer without eating? Or what's your experience on that? My own personal experience of fasting was that it was quite difficult in the early stages. It's difficult getting through the first 24 hours because I think psychologically you're, you're, you're geared to have a hard time. You think you're going to have a hard time. Uh, and, and I think when your body suddenly gets this shock of not eating, um, you know, it makes you want, it makes you hungry. And, and but I think most of it is psychology. Um, and certainly when I did my first fast, I was lying around in the afternoon, you know, I started my fast in the morning, think, oh, pull me, I'm hungry, I must drink and I'm feeling weak. But after day two and three, you get used to that effect and it becomes, it becomes normal. And from day two onwards, um, with subsequent fasts, there's no hunger at all. And the choice to break the fast was just really, you, you've got to eat at some point, if you see what I mean. So subsequent fasts became much easier to do. Um, and um, because you, you were aware of the changes in your body. The trick was to dial down your insulin because you were not requiring as much insulin when you were fasting. So the trick was to get the insulin levels down to, to a, a safe level for you to not have hypos when you're exercising, but it was not difficult to do. Okay. And then what about, so then we put this layer on top of the fasting, this exercise. Um, you know, people are, they have this idea that they have to eat, like, like you mentioned, they have to eat to get the energy to exercise. But once you're keto adapted after some weeks, you probably can then exercise and fast at the same time. 
and um, get your fuel from fat. That's exactly what I do all the time. It's so much easier to, to manage uh, physical activity when you're fasted. I mean, if you think about it, uh, the, uh, wild animals, I mean, you never see uh, an eagle uh, flying uh, to hunt if it's, if it's not hungry. I mean, we tend as humans to go and get our food when we, we're hungry because there's more of a desperation to go and get it. So, and then we will eat our food, satiate ourselves, and then, and, and then, you know, we, we're just naturally lazy, aren't we, humans? So we wouldn't actually go out if we've got a cupboard full or if, if our tummies are full. So I, I don't think it's unusual to be exercising when you're fasting. And because you have such a store of fat in your body, you know, it's, it's 85,000 calories compared to, say, 2,000 calories of, of stored sugar, which is there more for uh, you know sudden energy requirements. Um, it, 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 you don't need to worry about burning you know a couple of thousand calories of fat, which will be around twenty miles of, of of walking or running, and you'll put that back on again when you when you get your food source. So you're not talking of depleting your energy source to any significant amount. So I think that is the key to it. You just have to understand that. Nothing's going to happen in a, in a two, three days, five days of fasting. The reason we didn't go further than five days was because we were starting to worry then about, are we going to start breaking down protein? Because at some point you're going to run out of your sugar stores and you're going to start to need to burn another fuel to get the sugar that your body naturally needs to produce. So we wanted to restrict it to five days so we were we were pretty sure we wouldn't be burning any any protein because at some point you're going to be burning your muscle mass or your protein stores and and we we generally think that muscle mass is 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 useful to have have more of than less of so we didn't want to get into the situation where we were criticized for starving ourselves because this wasn't starve but it was sort of starvation because we weren't eating but it wasn't what i would call serious starvation because we were controlling the fat burning and not encouraging protein um, degradation. We had some breath testing to, to show that we're in fat burning mode at our, uh, our respiratory quotient test. And it showed that all of us were in fat burning mode all of the time. So that was quite good. And then you also tested your ketones. So typically, I know there's a couple different values, um, um, but the, the values that they use in, in the US would be probably a little more helpful. But if you're just doing a low carb diet, you're gonna be within a certain range, what, like maybe 0.3 to maybe one to maybe two. And then you start fasting, you're gonna be higher. If you had exercise, you're gonna go higher. Can you can you just tell me roughly kind of how that works a little bit? Yeah, so 75% of people with type one diabetes are in the range 0.5 to 1.5. That's the blood ketones, beta okay. hydroxy rate. So that's, that's pretty average. I would argue it's more difficult to get into ketosis as a type one because we have to inject insulin and we tend to have to use more insulin because we put it into the skin and it doesn't act as, as naturally as it does in, in someone with no diabetes. So that does tend to block a bit of fat burning, but we can get safety into ketosis. When we did the run, my ketones went up to six, five and a half, six or something like that for a couple of days. And my other friend, John, the, the other type one who was running with me, uh, he's went up to around about the same. We wanted to test ketones twice a day for five days, and we wanted every one of the, the eight uh, participants to do the same because we wanted to show that you don't go into deep diabetic ketoacidosis if you're in nutritional ketosis. Mm -hmm. So when we pulled the graph of eight people twice a day for five days and just did a bar chart, you could not tell the type ones from the non-type ones out of that group of eight. So mm -hmm. from that, we 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 were confident that we were in the same nutritional ketosis state as our non-diabetic peers. The other interesting thing that I, I heard or I read in your your website that um, as far as you would think that uh, people would get extremely sore and very very have to rec you know really have to spend more time recovering. Wasn't there a point about there was there was not much soreness going on, which is very unusual? 
it was unusual when we started we were we were pretty confident that we'd be okay when we started um it was a bit tricky in the early stages but not one of us had any injuries at all and none of us had recovery problems uh, we all managed every single day to to complete our task and none of us had any aches or pains the next day which was remarkable but last year about this time of year i did a 150 mile run in a week it was along the canal network of britain so it was flat and and equally it was keto is i was on a keto diet then i wasn't fasting but equally i had no injuries or no soreness at all it seems to me that the anti-inflammatory effect of ketones is 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 very powerful in sport and i've met lots of people i've i've, I've interviewed a professional rugby union player uh, in the UK, and he said when he went keto, he was a type had type one diabetes. He had his best year as far as injuries went in the year after he started his diet. So there's something about keto which is is anti-inflammatory and, and good for recovery. Fascinating. What's the uh, longest you ever like? I know, um, you know, we're talking about 100 miles or 150 miles. What's the most you've ever ran, and uh, over a period of days, I guess in a row. Well, that was the, uh, the, in a, the longest distance I've ever run is 35 miles. That's the longest I've ever run. I, That's in one day. One day. That was a run walk rather than the run, more like an ultra marathon type of thing. Uh, mostly I just do 10K, 15K. I'm not, I'm not a great fan of long distances in that sense. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm not worried about doing 20 miles a day. It wouldn't worry me, but, um, it takes a lot of time to keep practicing for that. So I'm a bit lazy in that sense. I mean, you're pretty a lean guy, right? Yes. So you, and, and you still had how many calories of fat on your body uh, with your lean body mass? Well, I had a normal body fat mass for, for my type and, and it was uh, 85,000 calories. 85,000 calories and someone who doesn't have a weight problem. So that's plenty of extra energy to be able to <laughs> you know, do this activity. I think that's exactly it, isn't it? It's just getting the mindset right. And as I said, it was a. It took me a, quite a long time to realise that I can actually do physical activity without without fueling it first. I could fuel it when I was doing it and not have to worry. And that is so freeing, especially anyone who has type one diabetes. You don't have to worry. So if someone came up to me and said, "Now, would you like to go for a run, or would you like to go for a cycle ride?" I'd say, "Yes, let's go." I wouldn't say, "Oh my goodness, what am I doing with my insulin?" I'd obviously check it and I'd carry sugar, glucose, if I needed it. But I wouldn't. I could go. I wouldn't need to prepare for it. And it's that spontaneity, certainly in type one, that is so freeing for people. Wow. When people do marathons, I know they um, they consume. I guess it's called. Is it called goo or this gel? It's some type of starch or. or glucose that creates a lot of uh, digestive issues and a lot of uh, side effects when they're running i've i've heard anyway i don't know if you've observed that certainly i mean before i went into the ketogenic lifestyle diet i i used carbs the same way as everyone else because no one had told me and, and obviously the conventional way of managing diabetes with physical activity is to manage your insulin on board, which is the big problem. So if you've got too much insulin on board, which most of us have most of the time because of the way we inject it under our skin, not into a natural space, um, you're vulnerable to hypos. So the, the protocol for managing type one sport is to uh, reduce your insulin even the night before and add carbohydrates to your fueling regime, 60 grams of carbohydrates per hour is recommended. Okay. And imagine trying to eat that much when you're trying to, to do physical activity. Because, you know, our stomachs really should be empty. My, even my mum told me, you know, when I was eight, that I shouldn't go swimming after, after a meal. Because you know, our bodies don't, we can't exercise as well when we've got fuel uh, in our gut, really. It needs to be in, in the right place. So. It's so much easier. Yes, and and you don't have that anymore. That's not an issue. If you do happen to go hypo, it's it's six grams of carbs or something. It, it's absolutely nothing. There's a lot of different versions of keto. I'm just curious, what kind of um, plan are you on now or in the past? Yeah, I, I, I go from different ideas to different ideas. At the moment, I'm more carnivore than I have been for a while. Um, I will eat 
green leafy vegetables and salads. I do eat fish and dairy. Nuts I'm a little bit wary of because I think they cause insulin resistance. Some of the nut oils in, in me personally um, and probably some of the oxalates cause joint pains. A little bit wary of that. Um, I, I avoid all seed oils of any sort and um, obviously I don't I don't eat sugar or, or anything like that and I, I do take dairy. I find that milk and cream aren't very good but cheese is okay and, and for some reason yogurt seem to be okay. So it's a mixed diet at the moment tending to carnivore. I can never make my mind up on protein. I'm still the jury's out for me on protein. I've, I've been doing the Bernstein type of more protein than fat type of thing for a while. And then I felt that, I don't know, I mean, I've, got, I've gone more fat than protein for now. But I always stick roughly within, I'm 75 kilograms. And I, I last time I, I estimated the amount of protein over a week, it was a, 100 um, grams of protein per day. So 1.2 uh, grams of protein per kilogram of ideal body weight most people would say it's 0 0.75 to 1 so it's it's on the higher side but um yeah that's what i do i i find that some foods certainly the leafy veg can be a little bit carby and you have to be a little bit more careful with your with your blood sugar control i do find that meat fish eggs um are the easiest foods to use there's no doubt about that but but you know, but but I do eat um, a, a variety of foods as well. Um, alcohol, I've gone off it. Strangely, I used to drink like red wine, prosecco. I love beer, but I can't drink it anymore. I'll have probably two two glasses if I'm out on a nice summer's day with friends or something, because that's just what you do. You know? Especially yeah. in the UK, you have to live your life. Yeah, that's right. Sunny in the UK. Yeah, and um, but alcohol, I find it just my body tells me I don't need it. But I have drunk it in the past, and I I will drink it. But it's not something that features heavily in my in my diet anymore. I used to more five six years ago, probably. Yeah, me me too. I, I I can't tolerate any any more than a six pack on the weekend. I can't tolerate any more than that. Mm. But um, no, I don't I don't drink at all anymore. But uh, wow, this has been fascinating. I think um, um, I want to send a lot of people to your website. I'm going to put your link down below. But thank you for coming on, and I really appreciate this. Uh, these insights on this crazy thing you did, which actually is not very crazy. You know, it goes against what's called what medical wisdom, which I don't even think is wisdom, right? It's just again these certain fixed ideas that the medical profession has that end up, you know, not being one hundred percent true. So uh, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.